We all like gay people. Well, some people don't, and it's a big problem. But I'm using the exclusive we here to cover all of my bases. And what do gay people like? Other people of the same gender. That too. But the relevant thing to today's video is rainbows. And what are rainbows made of? Color. Setting aside the fact that the gay pride flag is objectively a terrible flag because it breaks rule 3, given forth by the hand of our lord and savior Ted K himself, this begs the question. How many colors could you fit on one flag? Moreover, how many colors are there in total? Some of you may have rattled off nine or ten discrete colors. Some of you may have pushed up your glasses and noted that there are exactly 16,581,375 distinct colors. And some of you may have just given a tired sigh and clicked off this video because I asked such a stupid question. Well, to answer it, let's establish a few things. First of all, what is color? Well, let's take it away in the thought bubble. You want me to do what? When fusion occurs in the sun, the energy released pumps up the electrons and hydrogen atoms to a higher energy state. They spontaneously jump back down to a lower energy state, and they release that energy in the form of light. This light is in the form of a photon particle, which has energy, and it's in the form of a wave, which has a wavelength and a frequency. And the particle was with the wave, and the particle was the wave, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. It hits the earth, and it bounces off everything, and it gets all jumbled up, and it heats and lights up everything. Cut to about 4.1 billion years later, the Precambrian period. One creature had the amazing idea that if you had the ability to detect all this light, you could probably get a pretty good idea of what the surrounding area was shaped like. <laughs> it probably wouldn't work though, right? Well, the creature in question is one of the most evolutionarily successful creatures to have ever lived, with over 22,000 distinct species and having existed for over 270 million years. It's also possible that the competition caused by the success of eyes was directly responsible for the Cambrian explosion, an unprecedentedly fast period of evolution. So it kind of worked. The design wasn't perfect when it emerged, but the improvement to it that's relevant to our story is the ability to differentiate between different frequencies of light. This was so effective that it has evolved three different times. Cephalopods use a practical design that uses the shape of their eye and chromatic aberration, which is a word to describe the weird way that light refracts based on frequency, to stratify light despite only having one kind of photoreceptor. The arthropods have been by far the most effective. The harbinger of blood-soaked rainbows itself, the peacock mantis shrimp, has 12 different kinds of photoreceptors. Uh, technically, this butterfly has more, but it's less interesting, including ultraviolet light, and to add insult to injury, they're arranged in a way that lets it see polarized light. This only makes it more unfortunate that they completely lack the brain power to effectively use such great eyes. Look at this color. Memorize it very well. Now look at this source that's going to prove what I'm saying. Now look at your man. Now back to me. Now look at this color. Is it the same? If you said no, congratulations. You have better color vision than a mantis shrimp. Anyway, fish evolved to have four different kinds of photoreceptors, which is pretty much all you need. They had very good color vision, and during the reign of the dinosaurs, the sauropsids were pretty much dominating during the day. But when you're a weaker and less effective organism, you gotta go nocturnal. Now... Color vision and low light vision aren't mutually exclusive, but they are adversarial, so the synapsids had to cut back most of the advancements that had been made in color vision. But when the dinosaurs died off, they had to re-evolve, well, they didn't have to re-evolve them, the genes were still there, they just had to make it so that they're no longer suppressed. Anyway, most mammals were content with just two colors, but there's a reason primate means number one. We're the best. We're the greatest, and we have a poor sense of smell that we need to compensate for. Anyway, we have three cones that can see blue, green, and red light. That's not red. If you could see only one color at a time, this would be what that looks like. But we can perceive multiple. But that doesn't really matter to your brain, because your brain just knows how much each of the cone cells have been stimulated. So it can perceive colors that shouldn't even really exist, like ones with a high red and a high blue, but no green. We perceive them according to this wonderful way, the chromaticity diagram, where three arbitrary points are selected, and depending on which cones are stimulated, the color is pulled in each of their directions. You may notice that the green area is way freaking bigger than the rest, which makes sense. Computers, which did not evolve in the forests of Ethiopia, found it much more helpful to compress this trapezoid into a circle. 
And they also came up with a much more obvious method, which is to use hue, saturation, and luminosity to represent color. This makes more sense from a logical standpoint. Hue represents what position it is on the wheel, uh, weirdly counting up from red instead of from blue, like the chromaticity. Saturation represents how far away it is from the center, and luminosity is something I haven't discussed yet, which is how much of the light there is. So the obvious answer to how many colors are there is that there's an uncountable infinity, which really just means that asking how many there are is a stupid question. There are as many different colors as there are numbers between 380 and 700, because that's how many wavelengths of visible light there can be. Or is it? Let's go back to the sun. As I said, the sun emits light when an electron falls from an excited state down to a less excited state. And there are only a few specific states it can be in. Granted, it does go off to ionization at infinity, but only a few of the jumps between states would actually produce visible light. This is the formula for calculating the change in energy when an electron changes states. We can convert this energy into wavelength using this formula, so the question becomes, what whole number values of n1 and n2 satisfy this inequality? Don't worry, I did the math for you. It produces this graph, which looks like it goes off to infinity, but it only counts if both x and y are whole numbers, and it crosses over the 2 line between 9 and 10, and it never reaches 3, so it really only gives us 7 pairs of integer values. Using the same formula, we can determine their exact wavelengths as these. Whew! That was a lot of math, but it was necessary. Or was it? Shoot. Well, I did it anyways. Next step, there are 1.2 times 10 to the 57 hydrogen atoms in the sun. All we have to do is determine how many possible different combinations of color can be produced by the collective sun. This is pretty simple. Just plug them into the exponent, and we get 7 to the power of 1.2 times 10 to the power of 57 possible different colors, which is huge, but it is a finite number. Counterpoint. Yeah, so the problem with this argument is that it presupposes that all light comes from hydrogen atoms within the sun. I mean, imagine helium atoms within the sun. Heck, imagine lithium atoms within the sun. Not to mention tungsten atoms and light bulbs, hafnium and arc welding, silicon and lava, indium in your computer screen. The list goes on. But even if you took every atom in the observable universe and stratified them by emission spectra, then put them all to their respective powers, it would still be finite. Or would it? If you recall- If you recall back to the hydrogen graph, it only doesn't go up to infinity because the section that extends that far happens not to include any integer for x. What if it did? Well, the formula for calculating emission spectra is the same for all other elements, except for this part. Rydberg's constant, which has to be calculated separately. Here's the formula for that, but I can instead just Google the constant for any given element and plug it in. And it doesn't take us very long. In fact, it only takes us one element. Any light emitted from a helium-4 electron in a state of n equals 2 or above as it descends to an n equals 5 state will be visible light, no matter how far up you go. So that's it then. No matter how much the eye could theoretically see, only a countably infinite number of different colors of light are possible, based on the nature of electromagnetic emission. But does it really matter? The human eye can't distinguish between colors that are too closely related. But remember, you're still better at distinguishing colors than a mantis shrew.